Um, so uh, thank you, Peter, for agreeing to do a session with us. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction of BE and a collective that we are starting at Brown, and then I will give it a cover. Um, so hello and welcome to everyone. Um, I know a lot of you have been with BE for a long time, and some of you are joining now. So welcome. Um, and about BE, BE is a platform. Uh, it was it, start, it was started a couple of years back with the objective of providing support to students, researchers, economists, policy makers from marginalized communities, and um, and our goal is not only to um, work on representation but also contribute to the perspective which is prevalent um, in in the in the policy making circles. And another uh, different thing about BE is that it is being led by people from these communities and and not by uh, and we do not have that sense of charity uh, in in doing this work. Um, so about BE's work, Arushi will cover more on that. But I just wanted to um, briefly talk about uh, I mean what where we have come so far. So um, in the past couple of years, we have been working on improving um, our representation in university spaces, job market, etc. Um, and a result of that has been that a lot of our people, including me, have been um, have take, get, got an admission at um, different um, universities, including abroad. Um, and then when we moved to uh, you know universities outside India, we we, we realized that. Uh, something that Dr. Ambedkar had said has come through that you know wherever Indians go, they will, they are going to export caste with them. Uh, so we realized that the the struggle of you know a, a casteless society of of uh, of of a egalitarian society, it this struggle needs to be exported too, so that you know so that what whatever the imagination of BE has been can be um, accomplished. So um, yeah, so with I'm. Um, with with this, we have started Vegampura Collective at Brown University, and the and going forward, uh, the goal of the group is going to be that we want to um, include researchers, students, staff from marginalized communities from mostly global south, and then we try we we will try to have interventions in whatever things possible and um, carry forward the work of BE. Um, so, uh, and thank you once again to everyone. And now I will uh, let Um yeah, Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, Aditi has covered quite a bit of ground in introducing uh, BE, but I'll just quickly also uh, talk more broadly about our objectives. Uh, so as you all know that this is a platform for economic students from underrepresented and marginalized caste communities in India. <clears throat> At Belgian Economists, our objective is to build a pipeline of economists from diverse and uh, underserved communities by way of organizing capacity building workshops in R, Python, econometrics, etc. Uh, more importantly, we aim to intervene in policy discussions, for instance, on health, education, and labor markets uh, from an anti-caste perspective. Uh, we have been working towards raising global recognition of systemic discrimination faced by Dalit Adivasi communities and also towards the dominance of upper caste communities in economic and academic sphere. Uh, so in order to continue working on this, we are today launching a new lecture series on global disparities and discrimination, uh, caste and race. And we're very happy to have Peter with us uh, to talk about systemic discrimination uh, to kick off this series. Uh, so I will now introduce uh, Peter. Uh, so Dr. Peter Hull is the Bruce Family Assistant Professor of Economics at Brown. Uh, previously, he was an Assistant Professor of Economics at U Chicago, a research fellow at the Bre Becker Friedman Institute for Economics. Uh, a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research New England and an assistant economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Dr. Hull studies a wide range of topics in discrimination, healthcare, education, and applied econometrics. Uh, most recently, he has worked on developing and applying new quasi experimental tools to measure and potentially reduce disparate impact and systemic discrimination in high stake decisions such as pre-trial release and online lending. 
so with that peter i'll give the floor to you thank you so much for being here and joining us uh yeah over to you, thank you. great oh well, thank you so much for that kind introduction arushi and aditi thank you for having me in, on this program I'm, I'm just starting to learn about uh be but it sounds like a like a really great initiative um and so it's a real pleasure to be here uh involved in it and thanks everyone for for joining um so I, i'd like to present a project today uh which is a a working paper um that's joint with uh, my two co-authors aislinn bowen at university of pennsylvania and alex imas at the university of chicago um this is work that you know started off uh in a fairly interdisciplinary place with us reading lots of sociology articles and you know field uh, uh, papers and books from other fields to try and bridge some gaps across fields. Uh, I'm going to be you know talking through it with kind of a lens on economics, but hopefully it's it's accessible and useful uh, for a brighter broader audience as well. Um, so we're calling this work systemic discrimination theory and measurement and you know the starting motivation here is is fairly straightforward, I think. Um, you know, as 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 folks know, disparities in various treatments and various outcomes across many fields um, uh, by things like race or gender or you know caste or other protected characteristics, uh, those disparities have been widely documented. Um, but studying them and sort of thinking about them from a structured perspective is not always straightforward. Uh, and the reason I say that is because you know there's sort of at least two broad views of discrimination and disparities. And those views have until fairly recently, I think become found their homes in uh, in fairly distinct fields and sort of been been, you know, sort of developed in fairly distinct fields. So in economics, in my field, when we think about disparity analyses and we think about whether they uh, capture discrimination, Mostly, uh, but not entirely, but mostly we tend to focus on what's what we're going to call in this paper direct discrimination. Um, and so direct discrimination is sort of the explicit differential treatment uh, on the basis of a protected characteristic. So I'm going to talk a lot about gender uh, today when I talk about protected characteristics just to be concrete, but of course uh, that can that can be that can be much more general. Uh, and so this focus on direct discrimination in econ can be seen in in at least two ways. So one is that in economics, there's a long theoretical tradition of modeling direct discrimination, modeling the ways in which actors or agents change their behavior as a direct result of observing uh, a protected characteristic. And sort of one of the classic sites here comes from Gary Becker, the great Chicago economist Gary Becker in 1957, developing a sort of model of taste-based discrimination or animus, so sort of direct discrimination because of hatred or prejudice uh, against uh, a given race or, or, or class. Um, then shortly thereafter, there became sort of theories developed that were focusing more on beliefs. So sort of how direct discrimination could arise even in the absence of animus. Uh, that's sometimes called statistical discrimination. It comes from folks like uh, Phelps and Arrow and Aigner and Kane. Uh, but these are all, again, sort of models of how decision makers, you know, change their behavior as a result of of viewing, say, race. And then empirically in economics and in other fields, uh, quantitative fields like economics, when we measure discrimination, we tend to uh, you know, often have in the back of our mind this kind of gold standard empirical exercise where we randomly manipulate the perception of race or gender or caste in the mind of the decision maker and then measure the causal effect of that perception. And so that's another example of how we can think of this as direct discrimination, we see the direct effect of perceiving race or other characteristics on, on an action. That's sometimes called an audit study or a correspondence study, depending on how it's uh, conducted in, in economics. Um, but you know, outside of economics and indeed across many different fields, uh, there is a broader view of discrimination. There's a broader view of inequity, uh, which you know comes from sort of indirect channels. So um, in sociology and in other sort of related fields, they tend to take a sort of systems-based approach in which discrimination and inequity can arise, you know, indirectly over time or across different contexts um, through non-group characteristics. So what do I mean by that? Through characteristics that are not explicitly, you know, defining a protected characteristic, but through other characteristics, which can nevertheless embed inequity and discrimination. 
And so this systemic view of discrimination or this indirect view of discrimination uh, is now very, um, very common, of course. So not only in sociology and related fields, but uh, more increasingly, uh, we see it in, for example, recent discussions of algorithmic discrimination and algorithmic unfairness in computer science. So we can see how, you know, even though an algorithm is not directly trained on, say, race or gender, it can nevertheless embed systemic biases uh, through non-race characteristics or non-gender characteristics. Uh, there's also sort of legal analysis uh, now, at least in the U.S., uh, embedding this this sort of this sort of view. And so that's what we're trying to study. To put a long story short, that's sort of what we're trying to study in this uh, in this paper is ways that we can bridge this gap, basically ways that we can bring some of the theoretical and empirical tools in econ to bear on these broader views of of discrimination. Uh, and so just to start, I mean, folks probably have already, you know, in their head, sort of an, a sense of what it means when I say indirect discrimination, but let me be very concrete with a super simple example just to fix ideas and, and uh, let us sort of make sure we're on the same page. So uh, here's an example, a very simple example from thinking about hiring and promotion uh, at Google. So Google is, of course, a company that hires many different types of people, but let's focus on software engineers and think about uh, three applicants to be software engineers at Google. Um, two of these applicants are, are going to be female. One of these applicants is going to be male. These two applicants have one year of experience, and, and this applicant has three years of experience. And so let's start by just imagining that we're in a scenario of direct discrimination, so sort of the classic view of discrimination in econ and other, other fields, where we have a recruiter at Google who directly discriminates against uh, female applicants. Uh, what I mean by that is that holding fixed other characteristics besides gender, so holding fixed their initial experience, the recruiter penalizes females, either because of animus in the sense of Gary Becker, or maybe because of statistical discrimination uh, in the sense of, of Phelps, Arrow, and Egner and Kane. And so to be specific, let's imagine that, you know, among these applicants, there's sort of these three job tiers, software engineer two, software engineer three, and senior software engineer. These are sort of jobs with more experience as we move to the right and sort of more um, uh, you know, benefits and, and pay. Uh, the rule at Google is that when applicants have zero to one year of experience, they are either eligible to be a software engineer two or software engineer three. If they have more than one year of experience, then they're sort of eligible to be a software engineer three or a senior software engineer. So let's imagine that this recruiter takes these two applicants, both have one year of experience, uh, but penalizes the female applicant, so slots her into a software engineer two position whereas offers the male applicant a software engineer three position. So that is direct discrimination because holding fixed the non-gender characteristics, in this case, the initial experience, uh, the female applicant uh, is, is penalized by the recruiter. Um, but now let's sort of roll this system of hiring and promotion at Google forward and think about you know, how this discrimination might propagate and become sort of embedded in non-group uh, characteristics and become sort of systemic. And we'll do that by imagining ourselves now a year later, thinking about the promotion decisions uh, at, at Google. So at Google, as long as workers sort of have one year of experience and have sort of favorable uh, job reviews, you know, nothing, nothing really terrible happened in their year, the first year at Google, they tend to get promoted to the next sort of rung in the ladder of uh, software engineer positions. And so let's now imagine that we have a manager who doesn't see the worker's initial experience uh, but just sees sort of their current job um, uh, title, uh, sees that they've worked a year, it sees that they have favorable job ratings, and so just sort of bumps everyone up uh, a slot. And so this manager takes uh, these two workers who were software engineer threes and promotes them to senior software engineer and promotes the software engineer two to a software engineer three. And so this is a gender neutral rule, right? There's no direct discrimination here. Holding fix the worker's experience, holding fix the signals that the manager sees uh, of you know the workers' productivity, uh, the manager acts in a in a gender neutral way. However, if we were to view sort of the system as a whole, and think about you know workers who are equally qualified to be senior software engineers by the end of their of their first year, we would see inequity here, right? So we would see that workers who are sort of equally qualified at, when measured by their uh, initial uh, experience. Uh, face different job prospects uh, one year later. And that is precisely because the signal that the manager sees, which is not gender, the non-gender characteristic that the manager makes their decision on, embeds 
the initial discrimination by the recruiter. So the job titles here are, you know, in some sense inflated uh, for equally qualified men relative to, to women, uh, and such that if the manager was just acting in a gender neutral way, uh, that sort of initial signal becomes um, becomes systemic. And so this is kind of the, the sort of general approach. Again, this is very simplistic, and this is, you know, a very special case of systemic discrimination in which something is sort of compounding over time, but it's an example of how non- group characteristics can indeed embed these, these kinds of biases, a very simple example of it. Now, at this point, maybe you're wondering, you know, is this discrimination? Is this something that we have grounds to call discrimination from some, you know, uh, official definition? And for that, I have, at least in the U.S., uh, an answer of yes, uh, at least in some contexts. So in the U.S., there's a very famous uh, Supreme Court case called Griggs versus Duke Power Company, uh, which sort of codified this kind of indirect discrimination as as illegal behavior, at least in some context. So the background here is that in the 60s, in the late 60s, this company, uh, Duke Power, uh, had a policy uh, uh, which enabled workers to transfer across jobs at the company uh, only if they had a high school diploma. Uh, and so uh, Duke Power is a power plant. You know, most of its jobs are sort of manual labor. And so having a high school diploma was not actually relevant for workers' ability to perform these manual jobs, but it served as a way to indirectly discriminate against Black employees because of ongoing discrimination in the education market. And the Supreme Court found that you know, this was, in fact, de facto discrimination, even though the policy was race-blind, because equally qualified workers, so workers with the same ability to perform jobs uh, as productively at, at Duke Power, uh, were disparately able to transfer to higher paying jobs because of this of this policy. And importantly, it, it you know, even though this was happening in the sort of shadows of the Civil Rights Act uh, in the US, and, and it's arguable that, you know, Duke Power was doing this intentionally, the Supreme Court said, well, it doesn't really matter whether it was an intentional thing or not, this was a case of disparate impact. And so whether or not Duke Power was trying to discriminate, um, you know, effectively, the policy you know, it had a discriminatory effect, such that equally qualified workers by race had disparate opportunities to advance in the company. Uh, and so, the point here, two points. One is that you know to sort of show you that that kind of example, where in this case, discrimination not over time but across markets, so discrimination in the education market uh, became embedded in discrimination in the labor market through these non-group characteristics. In this case, high school diploma. Uh, first, to show you that that has some basis for legally being called discrimination, at least in the United States, at least in some context. But the second point here is just to, just to reinforce that this kind of discrimination is not sort of able to be measured or modeled within the standard toolkit of economics. And so we pride ourselves in economics of having a very robust, you know, quantitative set of tools for thinking about, you know, in a very precise way, thinking about different social phenomena as well as bringing them to data ultimately. And our toolkit for doing that is fundamentally limited in not being able to sort of study these things. So in particular, that gold standard I was telling you about of where we sort of you know, randomize the perceptions of race and sort of see the causal effect of perceived race on an action, this policy at Duke Power would pass that test because there was no direct effect of race on ability of a worker to transfer jobs. And so in that sense, that test is very limited because it would fail to find a form of discrimination, which the Supreme Court found uh, in, their, in their legal review. Uh, and so this is you know, a long way to say you know, why we're doing this, this, this paper, what we think is the potential contribution here. Um, you know, what we're going to do in this paper is propose new tools to both model and measure this kind of indirect or systemic discrimination. And the first thing we want to do is just give a framework for separating direct and indirect discrimination. Um, and so we're going to use effectively, you know, folks who are familiar with, with the language of causal inference, we're going to be effectively using a potential outcome framework here uh, to distinguish between uh, direct and indirect discrimination. Uh, and the reason for doing that is because direct discrimination is fundamentally, as I've been sort of hinting at, a kind of causal concept. It's the concept of the causal effect of a protected group on an action. And in some sense, systemic discrimination can be thought of as kind of selection bias, admitted variables bias. And so this potential outcome framework is gonna be useful for disentangling those things. Um, and so what we're gonna do is develop this framework, which allows us to you know, 
focus from causal effects to what we're going to call total discrimination, which is any disparities conditional on a given researcher chosen metric of qualification. So kind of, you know, equally qualified workers receiving different treatment for whatever reason, either direct or systemic. Uh, that framework can be, you know, used for both thinking about what the sociology literature calls individual discrimination. So discrimination arising from a given agent's actions, as well as what's sometimes called institutional discrimination, which we're going to think of as sort of aggregate decisions that pool across multiple decision makers. I'm mostly going to focus on the direct versus systemic, focusing on individual decisions in this talk. But if folks are interested in this individual versus institutional distinction, that's also in the paper and happy to talk afterwards if, if, if people are interested. Um, so we're first going to give this framework. We're going to then, you know, I'm going to sort of skip over this stuff fairly quickly in today's talk to focus more on the empirical aspects. But in the paper, we also um, you know, think about different models of systemic discrimination and sort of think about potential drivers of sy systemic discrimination. So just as, uh, you know, in, in econ, we have this notion of sort of taste-based discrimination due to Becker and statistical discrimination due to Phelps and, and folks, we can think about different drivers of systemic discrimination here, one coming from sort of differences in information, so differences in the disparities of the way that, say, workers can signal their productivity. So that's kind of like the motivating example where, say, men had an inflated signal of their productivity from their initial job title relative to equally qualified women. But we can also think about what we call technological systemic discrimination, which comes from endogenous opportunities for skill development. So it's not about the sort of signals that the that the manager or the, the decision maker sees, but it's something more about true sort of productivity itself. So say, if we're thinking about labor market discrimination, we could imagine that uh, Black teenagers face uh, different opportunities to develop their skills by taking jobs over the summer relative to white teenagers, and that leads to subsequent sort of discrimination in the labor market. So we're going to nest both of those types here. But again, I'm going to sort of move quickly over the formal uh, characterization of, of these drivers. Um, the thing I want to focus more on today, uh, given, you know, I think I think the, the audience here is, is a bit more empirically minded, perhaps, uh, we're going to focus on measurements. So we're going to think about how we can bring this framework to data. The nice thing about setting it up as sort of a potential outcome framework is that we have tools for measuring um, causal effects, right? So we can sort of think about measuring direct discrimination. And then we can think about measuring systemic discrimination through what in econ we, we often call a Kitagawa a walk a blinder decomposition. We actually all often call it a, a walk a blinder decomposition. Uh, those were the two economists that sort of invented this idea of decomposing uh, disparities into explained components and unexplained components. So it's sort of a classic way that in econ we have we have thought about measuring direct discrimination. Turns out Evelyn Kitagawa, a sociologist, kind of invented this uh, decomposition twenty years before these two men. Uh, and so that's, you know, why we're calling it a Kitagawa Waka Blinder decomposition. But in any event, we're going to, you know, develop this way of decomposing total discrimination into direct discrimination and systemic discrimination. That's going to be our contribution on the measurement side. If we can measure direct discrimination through that kind of gold standard audit or correspondence study, as I was discussing before, then we can back out systemic discrimination from that and a measure of total discrimination. And so we're going to use that kind of decomposition to to think about the different drivers here in a particular context. And I'll give some examples of that from, from other work as well. Um, and then sort of, you know, to, to show you how this could work out in practice, we have a couple different experiments. So we first have a lab experiment, which shows how just sort of a proof of concept, if, if you need it, uh, probably folks in this crowd don't need it, but you'd be surprised, uh, some economists do. So just an experiment kind of showing how direct discrimination can indeed lead to systemic disparities that persist and in some cases are much larger and, and more persistent than, uh, than direct discrimination. So we have just a sort of simple online uh, experiment showing basically a real, quote unquote, real world version of that simple labor market example from earlier. And then we also have what we're calling a lab in the field experiment where we try and illustrate a sort of general method of applying this decomposition uh, to measure systemic discrimination. And we call that an iterated audit. Uh, and so the idea here is to sort of bring some of the tools from audit studies and correspondence studies uh, to bear on this on this framework, which allows us to disentangle these, these different components. Uh, and broadly, the goal here is to uh, you know, show how uh, systemic discrimination both can arise from different, different contexts, as well as how uh, we can now 
potentially measure it using using these tools. And so, you know, there's a lot of literature here that we're going to be connecting to. I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but I just want to show you sort of the different ways we're thinking about what we're doing here. Broadly, though, I think, you know, the goal here is to try and, again, sort of bridge some of the discussion in econ and some of the discussion in sociology and other fields, which uh, sort of take this more systemic view. Uh, and so I'm going to start by sort of going through the theory. Again, I'll, I'll try and give more of a high level overview of some of the, the theoretical aspects here uh, before turning to, to measurement and, and then um, you know, thinking about the, those uh, applications. Um, I think the, I, I'm not sure if this was mentioned at the start, I think the preference here is to hold questions until the end, but if folks do have questions and comments, maybe put them in the chat so that the, the organizers can sort of compile them and, and we can talk about them as we go. Um, I will say that if anyone has like a really burning clarifying question, like they just don't understand something very fundamental, I'm okay with you just sort of jumping out and saying it. Um, I leave that to, to your discretion. But in any event, I'm looking forward to the discussion here. Uh, at the end, please do put any questions and comments uh, in the chat. Um, okay, so so let's start by, you know, sort of formalizing some of these ideas. So everything I've said so far has been, you know, hopefully kind of intuitive, but but fairly informal in the sense that we've been using words. And in econ, one of the, you know, strengths, I think, of, of, our, of our approach to things is to try and bring things to math. And so we're going to try and give some mathematical notation to underscore some of those uh, those concepts and, and hopefully in doing so, you know, bring some, some clarity uh, to, to some of these issues. So we're going to imagine a very simple setup, kind of like the one I started with at Google, where we have a set of hiring managers, which I'm going to index by J, evaluating a population of workers, which I'm going to index by I. And we're going to imagine each worker I having some group. So the group is going to be given by GI. Uh, GI can either be M or it can be F. I'm going to do that to sort of make things concrete by thinking about gender discrimination, but of course M and F could be anything, including you know indicators for different castes or, or race or anything like that. Um, we're going to imagine workers have some latent productivity for the task, so that's sort of their ability to perform the the job that they're applying for. I'm going to call that Y star, and the workers are going to have some signal, which I'll call S, which is some prediction of their productivity, some observable characteristics of their productivity. And that could be like a vector of lots of different things, or it could just be uh, one number. It's basically all the things that are observed to the worker besides the group. So I'm sometimes going to call it a signal, sometimes I'm going to call it the non-group characteristics. And so managers are going to see the group G, they're going to see the signal S, and they're going to take an action, such as hiring the worker or you know setting a wage for the worker or evaluating the worker, something like that. And the way that we're going to think about this action is in a very, what's what we call an econ reduced form way. So we're going to think about the action as deriving from some rule, which maps G and S into AIG. So AG is just a function mapping workers with different group and non-group characteristics, G and S. Uh, now underlying this function ultimately could be the manager's beliefs about the worker's productivity and how it relates to G and S. It could be managers' preferences for you know, workers with different characteristics, as well as you know, workers of different groups. We're not going to model that for now. We're going to leave that sort of under the hood and just think about this kind of overall mapping. And that's going to be enough for defining the, the terms that we, that we want to study. Um, now, to think about the, putting this action in a larger system, so to think about systemic forces here, we're going to imagine that workers enter this system, or if you want to think of it, the economy, with some qualification measure Y0. So some Y0, which denotes their sort of qualification for the action at hand. And I'll say more about what Y0 means and, and how we can think about it in a few slides, but just to preview it, we could imagine that Y0 is Y star. So the worker's qualification for the task is their latent productivity. Uh, we could also imagine Y star to be generated from Y0 and the actions of other agents. Uh, and so that's going to allow us to think about how worker qualification might diverge from their productivity and particularly think about how a worker's productivity might be affected by other decisions in the system uh, as well. So I'll say more about that in a second. But this sort of minimalist framework is enough for us to formalize some of the concepts we've been talking about so far. Uh, so, for example, we can formalize this notion of direct discrimination as the manager's action rule AJ 
directly depending on worker group. So AJ M S for some S is different for AJ F S for that S. So holding fixed the non-group characteristics S, is there a direct or causal effect of the of the group uh, on on the actions? So that's what we're going to call direct discrimination. And we're also now have the, the tools to distinguish that from what we're going to call systemic discrimination, which is when the action rule depends on group indirectly through S among equally qualified workers. So what this notation means is we're going to condition on uh, the worker's qualification. We're going to hold fixed Y0, look just at workers with the same qualification Y0, and see how once we do that, and once we hold fixed the um, perception of group in the action rule at some G, how the actions correlate with G. So that correlation is gonna come through the dependence of S and G in the sort of cross section of workers, as well as how S influences the action rule. So it's gonna be those combination of, of things. And so this is discrimination arising indirectly. Why? Well, because we've, again, sort of fixed the um, perception of group in the action rule at some level G, that could be M or that could be F, but in any event, we're not varying that as we look across people of different actual groups, GI. Now, if we combine these things, we have a notion of total discrimination, which just says, let's hold fixed workers qualification Y0 and just see how actions correlate with group for any reason. And that could be because as we move across workers of different groups, conditional on their qualification, we sort of see the group change within the action rule. And so that could be direct discrimination as well as the systemic uh, form which holds group fixed. And so formally, we're gonna show you that we can actually decompose measures of total discrimination into these two forms, but sort of intuitively at this point, it seems clear that those are the ways in which group could cause actions to differ by uh, among equally qualified workers. So that's just some definitions, again, hopefully useful for just sort of formalizing these ideas. Now, let me tell you a little bit about, about this choice of Y0. So you'll notice that um, our definition of systemic discrimination and our definition of total discrimination rely crucially on Y0, right? We're comparing the actions among equally qualified workers. What does that mean? Well, this is, I think, really a feature of this kind of framework is highlighting the role often implicit in disparity and discrimination analyses of Y0. Um, by choosing what it means for a worker to be qualified for a decision, a researcher is either explicitly or implicitly sort of bringing fo focus to different potentially systemic forms of discrimination. And so let me give you two extremes to highlight this idea. One could define the qualification of a worker as the non-group characteristics S. So one could say that, you know, a worker, workers are equally qualified for a decision if they carry the same other characteristics on their resume. And that is, in some sense, implicit in a lot of economic analyses of discrimination, which hold fixed everything but the group. So if you think about a resume study or an audit study, those are implicitly holding fixed everything that the manager sees except for G, in other words, holding fixed S. And so you can think of that as saying, well, what I want to compare when I define discrimination is these non-group characteristics. But of course, as that first example at Google highlights, those characteristics might embed discrimination themselves. And so maybe that's an incomplete view. Another extreme, sometimes found in the sociology literature, is to set Y0 to a constant, maybe to zero, just, for, just to set it to something. That would interpret any disparity among, say, white workers and black workers as discrimination. So that would say that there are no inherent differences in qualification by race. Any differences that we see is due to some form of discrimination, at least at some point in time or in some system. So that's sort of viewing race more as a social construct, less as some sort of inherent thing. Uh, and you can think of these as, again, sort of two extremes. And then there's a lot of middle ground. And I think one value of having this kind of broader framework is showing how you, know, you can choose different pieces in that continuum from those, from those two extremes. And in doing so, again, sort of highlight different, different factors. So just to give a couple of other examples, I mentioned that one might call Y0, Y star. So one might say, well, two equally qualified workers are those who are equally productive on the job. So that would be formally setting Y0 to Y star. So Y0 is the qualification, Y star is the productivity. This is kind of the notion that's 
uh, implicit in the Supreme Court's, you know, finding at Griggs versus Duke Power, because what they were interested in is whether people who are equally able to perform jobs at Duke Power had different uh, uh, rights to transfer jobs. And so that's kind of the disparate impact standard. We allow for workers of different productivity to be treated differently because that's sort of relevant to the, to the business's bottom line, but we don't want there to be disparities holding fixed workers' productivity. Now that, again, highlights some forms of systemic discrimination. So for example, it would highlight the um, signal inflation at uh, Google, as well as the sort of, um, you know, kind of discrimination that Griggs, it was found in Griggs versus Duke Power. But it also is limiting because it, it could potentially be that, as in that example of sort of black workers and white workers uh, uh, in, in their teen years, not getting, differentially getting access to high school jobs and sort of, you know, building human capital. It could be that systemic discrimination uh, operates through a worker's inherent productivity when they when they reach a given action. And so we might want to set Y0 to some upstream measure of productivity or some upstream measure of qualification in order to capture systemic discrimination that becomes embedded in, in human capital. And that's, again, what we're going to call technological systemic discrimination. Anyway, so the point here is that, and I think this is a broader point, um, the choice of Y0 when we're studying discrimination is a researcher choice. I don't think that there is a right choice for a given problem. It's sort of, you know, what we want to study, but it's a choice that is often implicit, at least in economics. And I think often um, in other fields as well. And so I think one message, maybe a simple one, but hopefully a clear one from this paper is that we need to make those choices explicit when we study discrimination. We, I would, I would love to see papers you know, very explicitly saying we want to study discrimination among equally qualified workers defined like this, um, because I think without being explicit, often we talk past each other and there's sort of, you know, discussions which are harder and more frustrating to have, maybe because different researchers have different notions of qualification. Uh, and so that's, you know, kind of a one, one takeaway from this broader, broader framework. Now, uh, as I said, we're going to sort of move through the, the rest of the theoretical section here kind of kind of quickly in the interest of getting to more empirical studies. Um, but what we do in the paper a lot is think about how we can sort of now microfound these forms of discrimination or, or sort of come up with underlying models that generate these different forms and think about them. So in economics, there's this, again, literature of thinking about direct discrimination coming from either tastes or preferences and, and beliefs. Um, we're going to model uh, systemic discrimination in this paper is coming from either information or from technology. So information means that workers with the same productivity and same qualification generate different signals, S, by group, and those signals are relevant to the decision. So that's like the Google example where men and women at Google generate different signals of their current um, uh, position at Google. Uh, but you know that's sort of holding fix their their true qualification or, or productivity at Google. Um, that's also potentially the the story of of uh, Griggs versus Duke Power, where a worker's high school diploma was seen as a signal of you know an action, and that signal was ju disparately generated among black workers and white workers. Uh, but then there's another form of systemic, as I said, which is where you know it operates through the productivity itself, and so that would be holding fixed qualification. The Y star, the sort of productivity at a job is correlated with group and maybe the manager sort of acts on an accurate uh, uh, signal of Y star. And so even if, even if we have equal signal generating processes because of this sort of human capital channel, there could be um, uh, total discrimination as well. Um, and then the other thing to highlight here, again, just sort of to mention, not really to dwell on, you know, a lot of the examples we've been giving so far, because it's been easier to talk about that way, have been sort of examples of things happening over time. So like that motivating Google example was one where direct discrimination became systemic in a subsequent decision, or in the Griggs versus Duke Power, you know, it's happening over different markets, but it's sort of workers with existing high school diplomas versus not because of past discrimination in the labor market, face different job opportunities at, at Duke Power. The sociological literature also highlights how even in a given time period, because of the interconnectedness of systems, uh, decisions can sort of influence each other and, and lead to systemic discrimination across different uh, systems in a given point in time. And, and we're going to you know, think about that as well, theoretically. So that's, that's just to, to highlight that 
um, I don't want you leaving this talk thinking about just sort of this is a dynamic over time sort of phenomenon. Okay, and then, you know, if folks are curious, if they're interested in this sort of thing and interested in sort of the theory of discrimination, we have a number of sort of theoretical, very specific sort of toy examples of different ways that discrimination can arise and persist, both direct and systemic. And so here's a bunch of them. Um, if you're curious, this is just sort of the summary, but if you're curious about any of these, uh, please check out the paper. It's online, it's on my website, um, and you can see sort of these different examples. I think we've just scratched the surface in terms of uh, what we can do with this theoretical framework, but there's a lot of interesting things that you could highlight and, and potentially test, right? So some of these things you could potentially try and bring to data to, to think about you know, these different forms of discrimination. But where I want to go in the remaining you know, half hour or, or 40 minutes or so is to think about measurement. So everything so far has just been sort of formalizing the theory, thinking about you know, how we can bring some of this uh, maybe more qualitative literature outside of economics into the more sort of classic uh, empirical framework within economics. Uh, but of course, you know, a framework is only useful if it can be, well, I wouldn't say that, but a framework is more useful if it can be brought to data. Uh, and so we want to think about how we can potentially measure these different components of the of the framework next. So I've sort of hinted at this already, but um, the basic idea here is the framework that we've been developing, you can think of it as, uh, if you're familiar with the language of causal inference, a potential outcome framework, where we have actions, uh, which are potential outcomes with respect to group characteristics and non-group characteristics. And we can think about the causal effect of changing a group characteristic on an action, and we've defined that as direct discrimination. Uh, but we sort of know how to es estimate causal effects pretty well, at least in, in, in some settings, at least under some conditions. And so, you know, if you grant me the framework, you will have granted me the fact that we can sort of measure discrimination fairly well, setting aside some well-studied and well-known conceptual issues with sort of what does it mean to actually like experiment with group characteristics and group perspective perspe perceptions. So in practice, if folks aren't familiar, the way that someone might measure direct discrimination in a, a hiring setting with race is they might randomize names on a resume uh, between sort of what's often called distinctively white names and distinctively black names or distinctively male names and distinctively female names. And, you know, there's a question, you know, I think still a debated one in economics about what, what it means to randomize name, how salient is that as a signal of race versus other things like socioeconomic factors and stuff. I'm going to not deal with those issues here and sort of imagine, again, this gold standard case where I can go in and just like replace uh, 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 an agent's uh, perspective, perception of, of race uh, in their brain and, and sort of hold everything else fixed. Um, but, you know, that's that's sort of a well-studied thing. And, and sort of if you grant me that, then we sort of have a good way of measuring direct discrimination. And so, you know, what what we're going to what we're going to propose is that well we can go a little bit further by measuring total discrimination if we have a way of measuring worker qualification or dealing with potential issues in measuring qualification which we'll talk about in a second um if we were able to sort of <clears throat> hold fixed qualification and find disparities among equally qualified workers as the supreme court did in griggs versus duke power then we would have a measure of total discrimination, which sort of intuitively captures both direct and, as I've argued, systemic forces. And so if we can formally decompose that total discrimination uh, effect into a direct discrimination component, a systemic discrimination component, then we can sort of back out systemic discrimination through this kind of Kitagawa Waka Blinder decomposition. And so this is the decomposition. Here is sort of where we have the most amount of math uh, that I'll show you today. Um, but all this is doing is showing sort of formally, given the framework, how we can decompose sort of total disparities here, this delta Y. So this is just the disparities in actions among group M and group F at a given qualification level Y. So Y0 being fixed to Y. So that's delta Y. Formally, you can show by just like a simple, simple bit of math and rearranging that this can be written as the sum of two terms. One is a term capturing direct discrimination. So it's capturing how uh, the action rule changes in a causal way as a function of group. And one sort of residual, which captures systemic discrimination. And again, if folks are familiar with 
the language of causal inference, what's going on here is we're just decomposing a, um, a difference in means into something related to a causal effect and something related to selection bias, basically, if you want to think about it like that. So there's a pretty precise link here between um, you know, those two frameworks, which is maybe not surprising if, if you know me, I, I love putting everything into potential outcome framework, but, but this is, this is sort of the basic logic here is that we, we know sort of how to measure, um, causal effects. If we can measure total discrimination, then systemic is going to come from a residual, which sort of captures sort of selection bias. So the ways that actions vary, uh, non-causally in a, in a discriminatory way. And so we're going to now sort of propose a fairly general framework for doing this. So this is kind of challenging, right? So if, um, you know, if, if qualification is observed and, and can be implicitly conditioned on, then maybe we can, we can, we can get some ground here. So let's start with this, this sort of simple case. So for example, we could start from the sort of sociology case in some sense, in some, in some worlds where Y zero is a constant. So racist so social construct, we want to think about all, all discrimination by race, um, you know, arising from, you know, any, any sort of upstream, upstream discrimination. So let's imagine, for example, that Y0 is just a constant, or we could imagine that it's some observable thing like education levels or something which we want to hold fixed. So then let's imagine that we have the ability to do what I've been saying, you know, we, we sometimes do in economics, which is these, these audit studies, these resume audit studies, where we take a real group of resumes um, belonging to workers of group M and workers of group F. And we randomize some of the M resumes to distinctively F names. So for example, you know, we take the resumes belonging to men and we randomize some set of them to uh, have first names that are more conventionally associated with females. And then we take these resumes and we give them to a hiring manager and say, okay, which of these workers would you, would you like to hire? The effect, which you can think of as an average treatment effect on the treated, if you like this potential outcome framework, uh, the effect of that randomization to distinctively F names is going to measure average direct discrimination among men. So if we take the real men and we look at the hiring rate among real men who were, uh, whose names were not affected on the resume and we subtract uh, the average hiring rate of real men whose names were randomized to females, that's going to measure sort of the average direct discrimination component. And again, that's kind of a classic um, audit experiment approach to measuring discrimination in econ. But then we can go one step further and we can take the actual resumes and again, elicit actions not randomizing uh, the names. So we can take the actual resumes and, you know, maybe present them to a different set of hiring managers and say, let's like, what, who would you like to hire among the actual men and among the actual females? And um, again, we're sort of holding fixed qualification here, implicitly setting it to zero, but you could imagine doing all of this conditional on some observable measure of, of qualification like education. And so what we've done is we've audited resumes once, we've audited them again, one under experimental conditions, one under sort of observational conditions, if you want to think about it like that. And so what you can show in our framework is that systemic discrimination is going to be given by what I'm going to call the difference in disparities from the first audit to the second audit, or the second audit minus the first audit. Systemic discrimination is going to capture the ways in which the other elements on the resume, which is not the name of the worker, uh, differ among equally qualified uh, male workers and female workers, such that they lead to, to disparities in the, in the outcomes. And so just to illustrate this, if I have three resumes, a real M resume, a real F resume, and then I take the real M resume and I randomize uh, the name to be distinctively female, this comparison between the randomized resumes is going to, it's going to identify direct discrimination. This disparity between the real resumes is going to identify total discrimination, again, holding fixed Y0, which we're just sort of assuming is constant here. And so it follows that this residual comparison where we you know, hold fixed the perception of the worker as female, but vary whatever we vary uh, in, the, in, in the resume that's not, not the, the signal of gender, that's going to capture systemic discrimination. Um, and so we're going to illustrate that in a bit, uh, but I just want to say a little bit about this Y0 fact. So 
you know, this is all under the assumption that we have a way of sort of controlling for y0. Of course, a challenge here is going to be that often it's difficult to measure qualification. Uh, canonically, you know, one complication is that qualification is often selectively observed. So if we think of qualification as a worker's productivity on the labor market, we see that among workers who enter the labor market or workers who are hired, uh, but not among workers who are not. And so in many cases, we're going to have to deal with that fact that it's hard to hold Y0 fixed. Here's where I just want to flag some earlier work of mine in the bail context, which shows how additional quasi-experimental variation could be useful for overcoming this, this kind of selection challenge. Um, here's some high-level intuition, uh, sort of using some additional uh, quasi-experimental variation to selection correct certain key moments here in sort of classic uh, econ tradition of, of using IV to, to, to deal with selection bias. Um, but let me let me not let me not go into more detail there in the interest of time. If folks are interested, happy to talk about that. Um, in other cases, maybe we observe only a proxy of y zero, and we can maybe use some of the other tools from causal inference, which which show how we can use observable proxies of unobservables uh, to to deal with with that sort of omitted variables bias challenge. The broader point here, I think, is that you know again once we move beyond this emphasis on just direct discrimination and thinking about the causal effect of protected characteristics on actions, we need to be more creative for thinking about, you know, what data sets we need to collect and what quasi-experimental designs we need to use, what sources of variation we need to use to measure discrimination. And I think that's, again, going to be guided by this choice of, of Y0. Um, so let me then, in the last 15, 20 minutes, um, show you how this framework actually can play out so I can walk you through some experiments we ran, uh, which again, sort of highlight how systemic discrimination can arise as well as how it can be, can be measured. Um, so the first experiment is a lab experiment uh, where we use an online uh, platform called Prolific. I don't know if folks are familiar with that, but it's, it's basically an online platform where you can go and hire workers from around the world to conduct sort of simple tasks. Uh, and researchers often use it to study different behavioral biases and sort of incentives because it's a nice controlled setup where you can like sort of simulate a labor market. So we're going to go to prolific and we're going to recruit three types of participants and we're going to randomize people into types. So one of the types is what we're going to call workers. One of the types is what we're going to call recruiters. And then we're also going to have hiring managers. Um, and so workers are going to start by completing a test of basic knowledge in math, business, and history. So we're going to sort of randomize a, a set of questions from these subjects and give 10 of them to each worker. Uh, and we're going to divide the questions into two parts, part A and part B. And so each worker is going to get five questions for part A. Uh, they're going to answer as many of them right as they can. They're going to get five questions for part B. And again, these are sort of spread randomly across these different fields. Now, what's going to be important for analyzing uh, the results of these tests is that there's no difference in test performance by workers' self-reported gender. There's also no difference in how predictive uh, part A is for part B in terms of the number of questions that a worker got right. Uh, that's going to be important in a second, but I just want to highlight that for now. In the second stage of the experiment, we're going to take our recruiters we're going to show them the part A performance of a randomly assigned worker, and we're going to ask them to take an action. That action could be either setting the wage of the worker or deciding whether to hire the worker or not. Uh, and then we're going to pay recruiters on the basis of their action and the part B performance of the worker. So the idea here is that we want to incentivize the recruiters to best predict the part B performance from the part A performance, as well as from the worker's gender, which we also tell them. And so, for example, for the wage, we're going to we're going to set up a, a mechanism such that we want to incentivize the recruiters to set a wage that's higher if the manager, I'm sorry, if the recruiter expects the worker to have more productivity on part B given their productivity on part A. And so, we're going to look at disparities by gender in these actions, and because of this fact that there's no difference in test performance or part correlation by worker gender, any disparities that we see in the actions at this point is going to reflect direct discrimination. 
specifically some form of bias. It can't reflect accurate statistical discrimination. And so this is going to be sort of analogous to that first stage in that Google motivating example I showed you before. But then just like in that Google example, we're going to roll the system forward and now enter our hiring managers. The hiring managers are going to see a signal which depends endogenously on the recruiter's actions, as well as the, the worker's self-reported gender. And so, for example, the hiring manager might see the recruiter's wage offer for the worker and the gender, and they might make their own wage offer. Or the hiring manager might see whether the worker was hired by the recruiter and then decide whether to hire the, the worker in the, in the next stage. And so now these disparities are going to reflect by gender are going to reflect both potentially direct discrimination as well as systemic discrimination. And so for the wage example, like with that motivating Google example, we can think about signal inflation where the recruiters might inflate the signals of men versus women and how that might translate to the wages of, of managers subsequently. Uh, we're also going to use the hiring sort of um, experiment to think about differences in the precision of signals that that the managers see. So in the in the example where you know the manager either sees whether the worker is hired or not, um, you know that's the, they're if they're hired, then they're going to see uh, the worker's productivity and if they're not hired, they're not going to see the worker's productivity. And so that's going to be an example of sort of a objective measure of productivity being revealed or not or or some extreme form of signal uh, precision going to zero. Okay, so here is, um, just to set things up, here's the first stage. So what we're showing you here is the average wage that recruiters offer to workers who self-identify as male versus female uh, across different levels of their Part A performance. So this is the signal that the recruiters see. Uh, and you can see pretty clear disparities. So you can see that males are given higher wages than females pretty uniformly across different levels of productivity. And again, this is going to reflect bias or discrimination. So we're holding fixed everything but gender and just looking at, um, you know, the causal effect of gender on these different actions. If I look forward at managers, I also see a pretty sizable disparity. So this is the disparity in manager wages, excuse me, by gender. Um, and so this could, this is what we're going to call total discrimination here, but again, because we're sort of implicitly holding fixed worker productivity. But as we now know, total discrimination can come from both direct and indirect channels. And the way to isolate the, uh, the, the sort of direct component is to take this disparity and control for the signal that the manager sees. So control for the wage that the worker is given by the recruiter. That's the sort of signal that the manager sees. So we're gonna run a regression of uh, the manager's wage on an indicator for the worker being male and uh, the signal that's generated endogenously by the recruiter. And what we find is when we add that control, you know, basically we have removed that disparity. And what this is saying is that there's basically no direct discrimination at the stage of the hiring manager. All of the disparity that we're seeing in this first column here is coming from coming through the, the signal, coming through the non-group characteristics. Uh, and we can actually formalize this a bit more with our decomposition. So we can take that Awaka Blinder decomposition and we can decompose at each level of worker productivity uh, the total discrimination, uh, which, is, which is arising in hiring manager wage offers into a component due to direct discrimination and systemic. And we can indeed see that the vast majority of discrimination is coming from systemic. Uh, and if anything, you know, some of these direct discrimination components are statistically insignificant or at least very small. Peter, there is mm -hmm. a question uh, in the chat about mm -hmm. uh, gender distribution of recruiters and hiring managers. And did you, uh, in the, like, also I was wondering in the experiment, if you had any choice over who Yes. Did. Yeah, so we, we, um, we have a balanced sample of men and women for each of the three groups. And we basically ensured that by experimentation. So we stratified. Um, and you know, there's some interesting things which I don't have time to show you right now uh, about how these forms of discrimination vary by the gender of the decision maker. So male decision makers are 
more discriminatory, discriminatory, both in direct and systemic forms, such that if we were to change the gender composition of people taking actions, we would see differences in the institutional discrimination here. And so I haven't really talked about institutional today, but you know, we have some discussion in the paper about gender composition. And so, yeah, there's some interesting stuff there, but, but everything here is gonna be balanced. So it's gonna be an equal number of male and female uh, decision makers. And uh, there's another question about uh, why is the average direct discrimination negative for worker performance level equal yeah. to? So we need to put standard errors on these things. My guess is that it's not statistically significant. Um, we haven't yet put standard errors on these things, but I, I think it's basically a zero. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the point here is, I think, twofold. Again, it's kind of a proof of concept of how situations like that motivating Google example can actually arise in practice, admittedly in a very simple stylized setup, a very controlled lab exp experiment, but still. Uh, you know, to the extent that in this very simple experiment, we do see very large uh, disparities arising indirectly uh, through through the through the manager signal, uh, suggests that maybe you know we might find this more broadly as well. The other takeaway from this is again to sort of highlight this decomposition. So because this is a highly controlled lab experiment, we can you know correctly sort of decompose total discrimination into these two components. Um, let me skip the second phase of this experiment in the interest of, of time and show you sort of a, a more real world version of that experiment, which tries to bring these things a bit closer to what we might actually try and do in, in practice. And so this is going to be a lab in the field uh, experiment, where what we're going to do is take actual hiring managers. Uh, so before we were taking sort of, you know, people on prolific and assigning them to the role of hiring manager versus recruiter, one valid critique maybe of that is like, well, you know, who are these people who are actually, you know, taking these decisions? So here we're going to use another platform called Sentiment, where we can actually hire um, real managers at, at real companies with an average work experience of about four and a half years, uh, and basically give them resumes, um, not real resumes of actual workers, generated resumes, as one might generate in an audit study, but resumes that are generated in a particular way such that we can apply our sort of iterated audit, which I was showing you before with the three resumes. So this is going to be based on a landmark uh, audit study by uh, Deva Pager in 2003, also a sociologist, I should say. Uh, this is one of the earlier um, audit studies out there where she was studying discrimination on race. And she found uh, that if she randomized uh, the, the names uh, of workers on a resume, uh, black worker, uh, white workers were given interview requests at twice the rate of, of black workers. Um, and so what she's going to do is, is what we're going to do is we're basically going to take her, um, uh, her data effectively. We're going to take her, her resumes and we're going to generate new resumes, which take into account this, uh, potential, uh, discrimination. And so we're going to take uh, three, we're going to generate three types of resumes. One, which is going to be, um, you know, holding fixed everything but the names. So we're going to generate resumes and just sort of vary the names uh, as we would in a, in a typical audit study. And the second is going to be, you know, using the fact that in the first, in the quote unquote first round of, of Pager's audit study, uh, you know, white workers were given jobs at a higher rate. And so we're going to randomize, randomly vary the resumes themselves to reflect that that disparity. And that's going to give us sort of the three sets of resumes, which we can use to um, make these make these comparisons. Uh, and importantly, we're going to tell hiring managers about the study. So we're not going to, you know, uh, you know, there was maybe a question in the earlier experiment where, you know, how much do the hiring managers know about what the recruiters do? You know, how much of it is that they're just sort of acting automatically and like passing through the discrimination without knowing it, how much are they intentionally doing it? Here, we are gonna try and get at this by actually telling these real managers about the earlier study and be very upfront that we are interested in studying uh, discrimination of that kind. Um, and so we're then going to, you know, basically give these random resumes to these hiring managers and elicit their uh, preferences for them uh, both in terms of what they think the likelihood is that these workers would get hired, 
and what they think the likely starting salary is of these, of these workers. And so here's the results from that experiment. The first thing I wanna show you is about hiring rates. So if you remember back to that picture of the three resumes, this is the sort of real world version of that picture. The first column is the hiring rate among white workers uh, who are sort of endogenously given more uh, work experience through the, the pager audit study results. Uh, on the right here, this column is black workers who are given less work experience through the pager audit study results. And then in the middle are the white workers who we randomized to distinctively black names. And so what you can see here is that there is a big disparity between the leftmost column and the rightmost column. And that's going to capture total discrimination in line with that with that picture. And so this is going to be, you know, the overall effect of of that initial discrimination on subsequent subsequent uh, actions. Uh, but then we can decompose that into the amount which is due to race per se. That's this first comparison, which again seems to be quite small of the total share. Most of the disparity, most of the discrimination here is coming from systemic. It's coming from the fact that in the pager audit study white workers were given more uh, work opportunities and therefore their resumes are more impressive by the time we give them to, uh, to these, these uh, work, uh, hiring managers on, on sentiment. And so this is again an example of how that form of systemic discrimination can arise and how it can be orders of magnitude larger than the direct component as well as how it can be measured. And just to, for completeness, we can also do this for wages. It's even more striking for wages. So if we look at the wage that managers expect to pay these workers, it's a pretty big gap. And the vast majority of it is, again, coming from the, the systemic component. Um, so let me uh, let me then wrap up. So that's basically the, the results that I, I have to share with you today. And then we can pause and happy to have a conversation with our remaining time. Um, the point of this paper is to propose and start to apply some new tools to both model and measure systemic discrimination. Again, I think the key insight here is this notion of Y0, which is often implicit in different studies of discrimination and which we're gonna argue should be made explicit in order to, to make progress here. Um, we think that this iterated audit study, you know, idea can be quite useful in potentially different settings. Uh, and so we're gonna try and, you know, propose that this be, be used potentially for, uh, you know, bringing these concepts to data. And we've started to think about how to do that, but we'd be very open if folks have ideas about different areas where we could apply it or different ways we could apply it. Um, and, and let me just, you know, wrap up by saying that regardless of, you know, the academic and intellectual um, motivation here, I think from a policy perspective, as we think more and more about, you know, how important systemic factors are for influencing uh, uh, decisions in, in, in different domains, uh, these sorts of tools, I think, will be incre increasingly useful for policymaking. Uh, and so I'd encourage folks who are interested in this to, um, you know, help us sort of push out these tools and, and develop them further, because I think they're only going to become more important uh, as, as, we, as we start to care more about these, these sorts of issues. So uh, let me wrap up there. Let me thank the organizers again for letting me uh, come and, and, and share these results. And I'm looking forward to sticking around if, if uh, folks want to chat and have any questions. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, this is very engaging. Uh, maybe I'll just open the floor to questions. Um, if there are any more, uh, yeah, Asad, if you would like to unmute yourself and go ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you. So, uh, uh, so I like your theoretical model. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, so this was from the perspective of the labor market, and there is a manager who is hiring employees. I was wondering, could it be extended to the political scenario? So let's say there is a politician, and he or she uh, has to provide public goods to various neighborhoods in his in his or her constituencies. There would be some neighborhoods wh which are not which do not usually vote for uh, him or her. And uh, the basically the, the this could be usually because voting is on the lines of caste and religion, especially in India. And uh, so since there is not much incentive to provide those kind of public goods to that area, uh, they, they could, there is uh, some uh, inherent discrimination in build. And then there are different levels of politicians, like you discussed uh, managers, and then there are 
I forgot the other name. Uh, there is a recruiter and there is a hiring manager, right? So at the politician level, there are different levels. So there is a member of parliament, there is a member of legislative assembly, and then there is a ward member, which usually lives in the same neighborhood. So how could this be uh, expanded or would it be too much of a stretch? I'm not sure. No, it's a great idea. I actually haven't thought about this uh, angle before. We we talk about, diff- so yeah, I've been focusing on labor markets because it's sort of simple to stay in one domain, but we do talk about other settings like healthcare and lending and criminal justice, et cetera, in the, in the paper. I will say politics, that's one I haven't really thought about before. I think it's quite interesting. Um, off the top of my head, uh, the way I would think about it is well, what is a natural choice of Y zero for a man for a politician thinking about you know how to allocate their attention to different districts or neighborhoods and things? One thing, just to you know, sort of spitball here, is maybe you think that some measure of qualification. If we think of what the politicians sort of trying, what their objective is, it's to get reelected, right? It's something like to get more votes supporting them in the next election. And so maybe you could imagine a scenario where a politician you know, if they were to invest politically in some neighborhood, they would get a lot of votes from doing so, but they choose not to do so because they are discriminating against, you know, the types of people that live in that neighborhood, right? So like a politician, just to give an extreme example, a politician might, you know, benefit a lot politically from building roads and bridges in, I'm going to use a U.S. example, in a state, in a, in a county with a lot of black voters in it, but the politician doesn't want to get support from black voters because maybe they're discriminatory. Uh, and so they they don't actually make that investment. That would be an example like direct discrimination. Could also be that there are systemic factors. So, you know, the politician doesn't invest in a neighborhood because, uh, let's see, because maybe their voters in other neighborhoods would uh, see that such investment as, you know, wasteful or something. Maybe there's uh, sort of non race characteristics uh such as income or you know other sort of flags that that could provide cover from 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 not investing in that district that might be sort of how i would think about it i think it's a really interesting question though um and i think you're right that like the different levels of politicians sort of in line with that with that sort of um you know motivating example would be another another way to to cut that so i haven't thought about before Super interesting. If you have further thoughts and ideas about it, happy to talk about it. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Um, thanks, Asad and Peter. Um, there was uh, um, there's one question about the experiments. Yeah. About kinds of jobs. What are your tech jobs? Oh, um, these. So in you're talking about the second experiment. I think when we get actual hiring managers, they are across different. Um, different uh, uh, industries. Uh, they're not all tech jobs. I forget what the distribution looks like exactly, but it's it's fairly representative. Um, so Sentiment is a platform which tries, because mostly what they try and do is like do opinion poll resourcing and, and sort of like trying to get, uh, you know, industry research. And so they have a pretty broad base. And so I think we we picked a pretty broad base, but I don't remember the exact distribution. Oh, great. And uh, there seems to be one philosophical question about what are the instances in which mm. Y0 not equal to zero could be justified? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think, you know, my my takeaway on this, and, and I think people can have different views on this, of course, but my takeaway is that there is no right Y0 necessarily. I think the choice of Y0 depends on what you are interested in studying, as well as what policy prescriptions you might be interested in in deploying. So one might think that since race is a social construct, Y0 should be zero in the sense that any disparity is due to discrimination. However, when one is thinking about what policies might be available to remedy that, perhaps one wants to take a sort of narrower view of Y0, which holds fixed the things that we can't change by policy, and focuses on the things that we can change. And so from that perspective, then thinking about what the Y0 is that would allow us to you know, focus our attention on the actionable ways of reducing discrimination, I think is a valuable goal. Another way to answer your question is in some context, the law tells us what Y0 should be. So 
I've done a lot of work in, again, pretrial sort of bail decisions. And in, in bail, the judge has a legal obligation to release people before trial who have a low probability of pretrial misconduct and detain people before trial who have a high probability of pretrial misconduct. And so the law sort of tells us that pretrial misconduct is the right measure of Y0. We want to treat people with the same potential for pretrial misconduct the same way, even though it could be that potential for pretrial misconduct bakes in a lot of systemic factors. So it could be that Black defendants have a higher potential for pretrial misconduct because of factors that make them live in higher crime areas or more poverty or lots of other things. That's obviously true and, and very interesting and important to study. But from the perspective of the law, we sort of want to focus on a particular channel just to detect illegal behavior. So I think the main message here is that I don't think there's a right Y0. I think that in a lot of cases, Y0 equals zero is the right, is the sort of intellectually right stance in what constitutes discrimination. But mm -hmm. from a policy perspective, we might choose different things based on what we want to accomplish. And from a research perspective, we want to highlight potentially different channels as well. Yeah, Kishan has a comment about some work in India uh, by Sukdev Torat and uh, Paul Atwell. Uh, it's, but my understanding of that work is that it's basically an audit study uh, where they randomize uh, names uh, by caste. And there also seems to be some recent work in India where they randomized uh, names by religion instead and show that uh, there, is, there are differences, but I'm not sure if um, they take into account systemic uh, modes of discrimination, at least not quantitatively. Like, mm. There is lots of uh, qualitative literature on systemic discrimination in India, but I'm not sure if. That's very interesting. I will say, you know, I, I should have said this at the start. I know very little about sort of the Indian context and caste discrimination. I'm very, I'd love to learn more. One of the reasons I was very excited to, you know, uh, join join this call was was to get the chance to learn more. So if, if folks have resources like this, um, you know, which sort of adds some nuance to the things I've been saying, which has been mostly focused in a US context, um, please do send it to me because I'd love to learn more. That seems like a great opportunity. Um, I see there's some questions in the chat. I don't know. Sorry, I can't hear if people are asking. Um, 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 okay. Sorry, Aditi has a question where she was trying to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Peter. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I am sorry if I missed you, but I was also thinking in terms of when we talk about uh, labor market or any discrimination, uh, the, the prerequisite for it is that people apply for those uh, posts or, you know, they enter the market but um, I was thinking that a lot of this discrimination, in my understanding, the systemic discrimination also stems from the fact that you're not even aware of this, uh, the opportunities, and you have no access to the market. So um, is that also included in the model, or, um, or have you thought about it? That's a great point. Yeah, so, um, so the model is focused on sort of a single action. And, um, you know, thinking about whether direct and systemic forces can influence that given action. So we are sort of conditioning on the people who are subject to that action. Now, it could be that, you know, the, that is a selected group of people, as you say, like the, the people who are able to apply the job is sort of already selected by some discriminatory force. Depending on how you choose Y0, you know, you can account for that. So if the sample you're looking at is a selected sample, if in the population, say, men and women are equally productive, but because of upstream discrimination, the sample of people who apply is you know, mostly males, then you're going to have an unequal distribution of productivity in that selected sample. And so if you're able to correct for that, if you set Y0 to Y star and measure productivity, you would pick up that selection as part of the discrimination. 
Um, I think a more complete version though of the model, maybe what you're getting at is, is would, be, would be one which kind of looks at these different actions in sequence. And we have some examples, some theoretical examples that try and get at that, um, but I think we've only scratched the surface there. So uh, short, short answer is that I think to the extent that there's upstream discrimination governing selection into the sample, depending on how you set Y0, you can pick that up. Um, but longer, a better version, I think, of studying that would be to extend our model to have sort of a sequence of actions. In some yeah. sense, the model is complex enough with one action, but I think you can make it you can make it more interesting with with multiple actions. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. I, I mean, it's great if we can extend the model to include that um, factor because um, it's also just the understanding that um, something that we are also trying to do through Boston Economist is that you know letting people know that there are opportunities because um, I mean I think that does not come under the formal definition of discrimination but i think when we talk about um system discrimination and all of this you know um i mean works towards um causing obstacles in getting to the market itself yeah yeah i agree yeah i, I think there's more work to be done there for sure um yeah i guess maybe this could be the last question uh if you could, there's a question in the chat, of if you could explain the rationale behind labeling bias, a selection bias system. Yeah, so, so, so I wanna be careful with that. I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of making any um, deep connection there. It's more of like a, um, just a methodological connection where you can, you can cast what we're doing as um, you know, linking different forms of disparities to a potential outcome framework. And if you grant me that direct discrimination is a causal concept, like it's the effect of perceived gender or race on outcomes, uh, and you grant me that total discrimination is sort of the overall disparities, um, then what our decomposition shows formally is that systemic discrimination is the residual. It's like total disparities minus the direct effect or total disparities minus the causal effect. And just mechanically, you know, we have this tradition in econometrics of calling that residual selection bias. So to say that it's, you know, it's whatever's left over in the disparity that's not explained by the causal effect. So that's like a language thing uh, that's helpful maybe for folks who, you know, are used to that language and, and seen it in, in, you know, some econometrics uh, textbook or something. Uh, but it's not it's not a deep connection. Uh, it's certainly, you know, for someone not steeped in that language, it might sound a little strange to call discrimination selection bias, but um, just formally that's that's there's a there's an econometric connection there. So if that's if that's not helpful, don't worry about it. That's not a deep part of the framework. Yeah. Great. I think uh, unless there are other questions. Oh, yeah. Do you want to come here? Yeah, there's that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Peter. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Uh, I was wondering, just because you mentioned a little bit about how the industries were in your experiment were fairly representative. Like, was did you ever consider, I guess, um, looking at how like the, the causal relationship was different depending on different industries? Just because I know at least, mm -hmm. um, like in the context of caste discrimination, it's much more prevalent in tech just because there were there tend to be more South Asians recruited for those yeah. positions. So that was, at least that was the context I was thinking about. It. Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't, I don't think we've looked at that. I think it's it's something we could easily do because we have the industries, but I, I think we just haven't yet. So we'll add it to our list. It's a good suggestion. Yeah, no, more. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we can, with that, we can um, wrap it up for today. Thank you so much, Peter, for making the time for this and also like for kicking off these the series on uh, global discrimination and disparities, um, caste and race. Um, and thank you everyone for sticking it out. And uh, we really hope that this can the framework can be useful for researchers in India studying these questions. Uh, and I see that a lot of very interesting conversation is already taken place in this call uh, and hopefully we can keep 
talking about PC. Yeah, I'm sorry to people online, we have pizza here. <laughs> so, uh, we are going to celebrate after this. Uh, if you want to join, come join Brown. <laughs> and Peter, you should come to us and for pizza. <laughs> I will, yeah, I will. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Nice to nice to meet everyone. And yeah, I hope we can keep the conversation going. And good luck with the rest of the rest of the seminar series. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank right. you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Hey, hey, let's record again.